Out of the heart comes the issues of life. And there's not a greater issue in life than our relationships that we form. The relationships that we form scar or build our life. I could ask you to think about the most important decision or the relationship that you have. You would either put a smile on your face to say that relationship is phenomenal. Or there's many of us that would say that relationship has caused pain. We have all kinds of different people that have gone through all kinds of different issues in all kinds of different areas within their life. And the relationship scars are prominent in our life. The commodity of life sometimes we look at is relationships. The people that either put a smile on our face or cry in our eye. Why is that? 85% of everything that we do has to do with some form of a relationship. So today we're going to be talking about relationships. Now when we talk about relationships, we're not talking about the elbow to somebody. We're talking about you. We have to look at our own personal life to get an idea of how do I fix my life? How do I fix my relationships? Because relationships have to be built on who am I? Not what I can fix, not what they need, but what do I need? So when we look at the healthy heart, we, we watch this out of the heart, the abundance of life speaks. Out of the heart. So we have to go back to a very simple form, and I want to use uh, the phrase CPR. CPR, and then I want to take some ideas what life is all about. In uh, John chapter 11, it tells us a story of Lazarus, and, and Lazarus was very sick, and, and Mary and Martha, whom Jesus loved, came up to Jesus and said, Lazarus, one of your buddies, one of your best friends is about ready to die. And Jesus said, okay, I love him, but I am doing something very important right now. I don't have time to go to take care of him. So he waited for two days, and he got word that Lazarus died. And Mary and Martha, they were very upset with Jesus. They said, they said only if you would have been here, only if you would have come, as soon as I told you that your friend Lazarus is about ready to die, he could be saved. He said, you know what? I am at the right place at the right time, doing exactly what I am supposed to do, God will be glorified. I want to say a story, and I want to talk to you about relationships. The first part of CPR is commit. We have to commit. Clear honesty. We have to commit our life to God. Now, here, here, stay with me here. You can only be you. He or she can only be he or she. When you look in a mirror and you see yourself in the morning, you see yourself as who you are. Somebody else looks in the mirror, they are who they are. But whenever there's a relationship, there's times where who you are, they are trying to fix you or change you to who they want you to be. And anytime somebody changes you or tries to change you for who they want you to be, you look in the mirror and say, this is hard. I can't be who you want me to be. I have to be who I am. And anytime somebody makes or tries to make you change to please them, it may work for a time, for a season, or even a year. But sooner or later, you're going to look in that mirror and say, I don't know who you are. I don't want to be somebody else. I want to be me. So what has taken place in the level of commitment is this. We have a, a box or a life full of desires. And in any relationship, you, you meet this relationship, whether it's at church, whether it's at work, whether it's in your home, and you say, this is what I aspire to. This is what I want to desire to. I want this, and I need this in my relationship. So you start telling everybody what your desires are. And everybody has this God moment that they want to share and experience life, and they want to give all these desires out. And we go into counseling, and they say, this is what I wanted. This is what I desired. But all of a sudden, the desire has then turned into expectation. What I wanted is now demanded. And what is demanded is expectations. And if somebody does not meet the expectation, what happens is conflict. 
I, there's no more of a desire. Now it's demanded. Now it's expected. Now if you don't meet my expectation, I am going to be mad. There's going to be a knockdown, drag out fight. What once was a God-honoring, fearing desire of life has now been hit head on with expectations. And then those expectations, if you are not met, then you look at that and say, why didn't you do that? Before, hey, can we do this? Now it's, why don't we do it? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't we having this much fun? Why? Is because the desire has turned into expectation, and that expectation has turned into conflict, and now we live in a conflict home, church, work, wherever the relationship is established. What we have to do is we have to take the I and put the I on them and say, you know what, it's not about me. It's not about what I want all the time. It's about what is needed. We have to make a commitment to the future. And we make a commitment to the future by getting the I off of myself. I can only be me. You can only be you. I can't make you be who I want you to be. I have to accept you and be committed to you for who you are. I have to be related to this. I have to be committed to any relationship for who they are. When I see you, when I have a relationship, when I have a friendship, what I have to do is I have to accept you for who you are. In uh, chapter, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now the man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, the Mary whom the brother of Lazarus now lay sick, and the same one who poured perfume at the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. She, the sisters went to the Lord and said, One that you love is sick. The one that you love is sick. There has to be a commitment. A commitment to say, I am going to do what I have to do, but I have to do it in God's timing. When I understand that I have to be commit, I have to be honest, I have to share my feelings, I have to share my emotions, I have to be able to open up and communicate in a church setting. Whenever we have a conflict, whenever there's a dispute, we have to be committed that I understand that we are different. I understand our personalities may be different. I understand that things may not be exactly the way I want to be, but I have to be committed to a relationship, a relationship to God first and a relationship to others second. Once I'm committed to that, then I need to persevere. I need to persevere. When I per persevere, what perseverance means in any relationship is this. I don't have to be happy all the time. There's a phase in my life, a time within my life, that I may not be happy, but I am committed to a relationship. I'm committed to life. I'm committed to my work. I'm committed to a job. I'm committed to a spouse. I may not necessarily be happy in every phase of my life, but I need to persevere during the storm. I can persevere knowing that there's going to be a brighter day down the road. I have to be focused on what God wants me to do. So in verse 5 it says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when they heard that, G that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews were trying to stone you, yet you want to go back? There's times where in our relationships it may be rocky. It may be fearful. But we have to persevere through those relationships. It may be a business deal. It may be an ex-husband or an ex-wife. It may be a church issue that you are, it's just rocky. It's hard. There's issues that take place. Those kids are giving you fits. We have all kinds of different issues and we want to build those relationships. And sometimes we cannot turn our back to what God wants us to do. So often in our relationships, we, we have all kinds of stuff that goes on. Maybe there's a conflict at work, or maybe somebody stole a deal from you. Maybe somebody was saying things about you at school, and all kinds of stuff takes place. And all of a sudden, the issues of life have been piled in front of you. And all kinds of different issues are piled up to a point that you don't know what to talk about. There's all kinds of different things that have gone wrong and problems that have occurred. And all of a sudden, you have two individuals standing on the, each side of all of the stuff of life. You can't even see each other because it's so piled up and so high. What do you do with the stuff in life? What do you do with all the junk? What do you do with everything that is piled up? And all of a sudden, you're trying to have a relationship, and you can't see each other because of the stuff of life. We get upset. 
we look at it, we see all the lies, we see all the deals that weren't made, we see all the cheat that took place, we see all kinds of different things in front of the relationship. So what do you do? If we take a piece at a time and try to deal with it, it could take for years. But what happens in most cases, we get so frustrated, we get so beat up because of all the stuff in life and we don't know how to deal with it. So what happens in most relationships, you're on your side, I'm on my side, we pull up a 12-gauge shotgun, and we try to blow all of our stuff up. We start wounding the other person. I may shoot over here, and this stuff may get blown up, but all of a sudden, the person that was straight across from me, that I loved at one time, that I had a problem with at one time, all of a sudden is wounded just because we had stuff that we weren't willing to deal with. And in church life, in, in the business world, or in school, we can't just blow our stuff up. We have to be able to deal, persevere, work through, and understand that we have to give all of our problems to God. In his timing, he will work everything out. We have to be faithful to him. And then the R for CPR is risk. Without love, risk means that you, you may get hurt. You may get hurt. In any relationship, we may get hurt. We all have different baggage. We all have different things within our life. When you, when you joined this church, there was stuff that you had in your life. There was baggage that you carried in. And that baggage that you carried in, and it's fearful to unload. And we can carry our baggage in in any one of our relationships. And we carry that baggage in, and, and we try to live out of our suitcase for a while. We don't want to take the stuff out and put it into the drawers because our baggage, it's It's delicate. It, it, it's, it's my secrets. It's what I know. I really don't want everybody else to know my baggage. Nobody else has that much baggage. And in our minds, we think that my baggage is worse than everybody else's. So in our suitcases, we try to live out of our suitcases. But after about three months into a relationship, after you join a church and, and you start talking about things and somebody has a problem and you say, I, I can identify with that, but in order for me to minister to them, I have to let them know I have some baggage and I may lose my reputation if they found out I have some issues. So we try to hide our baggage. We have to take risks in any relationship in order to form a godly, honoring relationship. It is going to take risks. You may get hurt, but in that relationship that you take a risk for, there's not a greater reward in a relationship than a relationship that you have mutual respect for because you understand the risks. You understand the baggage. You understand I am not perfect. You understand nobody's perfect. You understand that we have problems and those problems can be severe. So in CPR, there's four stages of relationship. I want to give you these four stages and this is relationship counseling 101 with a, with a Bible twist. When Jesus, when Jesus said this to his disciples, said, I know what I'm doing. I know Lazarus is dead. I'm going to stay here. I know I could have gone there. I know I could have healed him. But what I'm doing is the right thing. And God will be glorified when I show up. And I believe there's times within our relationships, in any one of our relationships, we have to say, God, what is it that you need me to do? How can I glorify you in every one of my relationships? In whatever I have, whatever I go through, wherever I've been. You know, in counseling, we have all kinds of different issues that take place in counseling. And we could talk about our exes. We could talk about our kids. We could talk about our peers. We could talk about fellow students. Relationships is so overwhelming, so hurtful, so harmful. If we do not deal with the emotional response of relationships, every part of our relationship that we have now can be hindered because of a past relationship that we have had, because of something that we haven't dealt with, some pains that have caused. And those pains of our past could hinder us from what God wants us to do in the future if we don't look at those relationships, positive or negative, do communicate who I am today. So I have to really put on my life 
what is it that God wants me to do? When I look at somebody, can I be completely honest with them and say, how can I glorify God in this relationship? Whether it's at school, whether it's at church, whether it's at work. So here are those four stages, and I want to talk to you. The first stage is the delight stage. When you meet somebody, when you meet somebody for the very first time, when you go to work and you're introduced to somebody, that may be a coworker. you go to church and you meet somebody and, and you try to build a relationship, and it's the delight stage. It's, if we would call it in the, in the church, in the marriage term, it's the honeymoon stage. Everything's great. Everything's great. You, you really are very superficial at this time. You're just talking, you're trying to be nice, you're trying to find common ground, and it, it, it's okay for a while. We can live in the delight stage for a while. But the delight stage never stays the delight stage when honesty has taken place. You can have a cup of coffee with somebody and you can talk about sports and you can talk about the weather. But in-depth relationship does not talk about insignificant things for a long period of time. If we ever want to get to a point that we have a deep, meaningful relationship, it takes deep conversation and honest work. The delight stage, the honeymoon, delight with each other. I can talk about how creative you are and how awesome you are and how vibrant you are and how great of an organizer you are. And we could talk about all the positives that we want. But sooner or later, those positives that we look at that we used to admire about then becomes the negatives because the opposites take place. The magnetism arises. If you are up here and, and you had the greatest personality in the world, the opposite of that takes place sometimes. And if you can be up here, sometimes the down here is way too low. And when we try to balance this thing out, we say, man, you have some strong points, but man, your weak points get under my skin. And if we do not communicate about the positives and the negatives of a relationship, then what happens is we live in the overflow we started trying to do the balance and we start saying man i don't know if i just want to be happy half the time i don't know if i want to deal with the negatives i enjoy the positives but the negatives sometimes are overwhelming so we go from the delight stage to realizing there's some dysfunction going on so the second point is dysfunction we have to realize we're dysfunctional there's not a person in this room that does not have some form of dysfunction within their life we can hide it, we can mask it, we can act like it doesn't exist, but every one of us have some form of dysfunction. And we say this a lot, we put the fun in dysfunction at Glenville because we have some dysfunction. What does that mean? That means we don't all agree about everything. So there's things that we disagree with and we get all kinds of different dysfunctions. Where do these dysfunctions come from? The first thing I believe, they come from family issues. Sometimes our past family issues have determined our opinions and dominate our thinking and sometimes our family issues are just plain wrong sometimes we have to say i understand what my parents said to me i understand what i used to believe but just because mom and dad said something or just because my previous church said something just because that's what i've always been taught may not be right sometimes what people have taught us in the past and our opinions of our past if it does not match up to god's word it's still wrong absolutely and if we are stuck in our opinions of the past and we do not have an open mind towards God, God cannot use us in a vibrant way. And we have to say, just because mom and dad, just because my tradition, just because I where I grew up, just because I've always believed something, if it doesn't match up to God's word, it is wrong. And I may have to confess my sin. I may have to talk to my mom and dad about it. I may have to go back and talk to my previous pastor about it. But if it does not match up to God's word, it is still wrong. Just because we always believed it, doesn't mean it to be true. How do we match that up? Because we have to take, what does God's word say? Because God's word that we believe is absolute truth, it supersedes any opinion of any person at any time because God's word is without error. So that's where we get our opinions. So if somebody has told you in the past, or a parent has told you in the past, or maybe a lifestyle, or maybe a church has said something that does not match up to God's word, you may have to say, you know what, that's dysfunction. I am not going to hold to an opinion about a personal perspective when God's word is absolutely opposing to it. And any time that we do that, we become like the Pharisees, religious leaders of the day, 
that would not look at what God says, they looked at what they wanted. And any time that we do that, we become dysfunctional. And any time that we take our opinions over God's word, what happens is we alienate the relationship that God wants us to store. Because it has to be your way. You become the dominant role in that relationship because your opinions meet more than any person's opinion. Your dominant position is more important than anybody else that holds any other position. And any time our dominant position that's not godly is in control of any relationship, God cannot honor that relationship. So family issues of baggage. Takes, you know, family issues have kinds of baggage all kinds of time. There's, there's a show that I like flipping the channels every once in a while, and there's a show that comes on called King of Queens. Anybody ever seen King of Queens? Okay, no, I, I see him because I watch King of Queens. Anyway, Doug and Carrie. Doug and Carrie were going over to Doug's parents, the Heffernan's house, and, and that was the first time Carrie has ever gone over to the Heffernan's house, and, and, and Doug comes walking in, and their dog, three-year-old dog by the name of Rocky, comes walking up and come, starts hugging us, starts looking at us, and Doug says, I love my Rocky, I love my Rocky. I got Rocky when I was in seventh grade. Carrie goes, seventh grade? You're 39 years old. Rocky's three years old. If you got Rocky when you were in seventh grade, Rocky would be 137 years old. Carrie looked at Doug and said, that doesn't make sense. But when they got up to the upstairs, Carrie goes, Doug, tell me about Rocky. Oh, Rocky, he was, he, I used to play with him. I took him out in the yard. We were best friends. All my, uh, he was, I could tell him everything. And Carrie goes, Rocky looks pretty frisky. Oh, he, he's that way all the time. Every time I come over, he just run up and down. He's just going crazy. And Carrie goes, Rocky would be 137 years old. Doug's eyes, ooh, you know, he's not the brightest cat in the world. Doug's eyes opened up. He goes, that? Oh. So he sheepishly walks downstairs and talks to his mom. He says, Mom, uh, Rocky, he, um, he looks pretty good. Yeah, he's doing, he goes, how old is Rocky? And Mrs. Heffernan says, um, I got to confess something to you. That's not Rocky. That's not Doc, Rocky number one. That's not Rocky number two. That's not Rocky number three. That's Rocky number four. And Doug goes, Mom, why didn't you tell me that? And here's what she said. She said, I did not think you could handle if I told you that there was a problem when you were a child. And sometimes moms, dads, us, we hide the truth because we don't want to deal with the truth. And if we hide the truth, high reality, because we don't want to deal with pain, what happens when we mask that pain, we start living a lie. And if we continue to live a lie, we believe the lie and we do not know the truth and if we stand in a lie, we have no foundation to stand on. One of these days, it will crumble underneath of us, and we have nothing to hold on to. We cannot live in a lie. We have to live on the truth. Family issues have to be dealt with. And I believe conf confronted, if need be. And then I believe uh, personality conflicts. Uh, dysfunction happens with personality conflicts. Uh, there's just some different personalities, and sometimes the magnetisms attract, but the magnetisms attack. And sometimes what you love about somebody is what you can't stand about them soon. So we have to deal with personality conflicts and this dysfunction, because if we do not deal with them, what happens is we fall apart. And then uh, self-centeredness. I believe the I of life. The desires and the expectations of life is all built on the big I when it talks about everything has to be about me. In any relationship, if it's always about I and not about you, the phrase, my way or the highway, comes up. And you know what? When you put that phrase in place, you know what most people want to do? They want to take the highway. They get tired of it. They get tired of I, I, I. So we have to turn in our relationships, not I, but you. What do we want to do? What do you need? What can I do for you? What do I need to do to help you out? So the first phase is delight. The second phase is the function. 
And then uh, the third one is disease. Uh, we always say this, and we have people here that uh, has gone through all kinds of different issues, and this is the sad news with good news. We found out you have cancer. The good news, we caught it early. That's devastating news. But at the end of devastation news, we have a positive. You may have cancer, but we caught it early. But you know what? Just because we caught it early doesn't fix the fact that you have cancer. What we have to do is we have to deal with the cancer. Knowing that you have cancer and dealing with the cancer is two totally different things. And in our relationships, when we understand that it is unhealthy, there's things that are wrong, there's dysfunction in relationships, and we realize that we see there's a disease, we understand the problem, what do we do with what we know? In Family Feud, one of the questions was brought up is, why do not men go to the doctor when they get older? Why do not men go to the doctor when they get older? You know what the number one answer is? They're afraid what they'll find out. They're afraid they'll find out. They would rather stick their head in the sand than know what the problem is. The most liberating thing, although we may not like the news, is as long as we catch it early, we understand what we need to do. But if we do not do what they tell us to do, the disease could cause death. And in our relationship, we have to understand it will take place. And here's the three points with the disease. The first thing in relationships, when we find out it's an unhealthy relationship, the first thing is avoidance. You just, you don't talk to that person. You see them walking down the hallway at church, you try to go a different way. You see them at Walmart, you try to go a different way. You just try to avoid them. You do not want to talk to them because you know if you talk to them about any issue, it's going to come up with a conflict. You just avoid problems at all costs. The second thing is when you do talk to them, it's going to be an argument. It's going to be a knockdown drag out. The negatives, the things that we do not have in common will come into clash. And any time that there's a relationship starting with disease, it's going to start with avoidance and it's going to go to argument. And then what happens? It always ends with animosity, bitterness. You just do not like each other. And when you get to the point that there's animosity within your heart towards another church member, whether it's an employee, whether it's a classmate, and it gets to the point there's animosity, there's no way we're going to fix that issue. That relationship is disease-filled, cancer-full, and it has no hope to survive. It's going to be full of animosity, and the animosity does not kill the other person. The animosity kills us. The hurt, the pain that hurts us on the inside is what kills the relationship. Now, that relationship may be over, but it's not over in your life. Because if that relationship has caused dysfunction in your life, that disease within your life, it affects every other relationship that you ever have. Because what takes place when there's animosity and there's hatred towards somebody else, there's the, what's called the lack of trust. And when you lose trust, you lose everything. And in relationships, when you look at other people and you think, well, they're going to do the same thing that person did. They'll never trust me. I'll never be able to do anything again. And we lose trust. We lose everything within the relationship. And the disease-filled relationship causes the fourth point, and that is death. Death. And there's two things that need to take place here. We need to die to ourselves and say, my relationship with God is more important than my relationship to others. And I have to humble myself, and I need to ask God to forgive me. That animosity, that bitterness, that hatefulness in my heart is wrong. I must ask God to deal with me. And then what takes place is when we die, that's when Jesus comes alongside us after two days later. And even the stench of death was all over Lazarus. But Jesus stood outside his tomb, and he called his name, and out of death came life. And even out of a dead relationship, when we ask God to forgive us and we ask Jesus to show up, and the Bible says in John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept at the very death of Lazarus. Jesus wept. Two mighty, mighty words. Jesus wept. There's things that move God. 
And I believe the humility of our own life when we talk about one of the most important issues other than our salvation is our relationship with others. When we put those relationships in the hand of God, God can do great and mighty things through us. And then there's a time during death when you see somebody that is struggling, that is hurting, and God says, I need you to do something. There's a story that I believe is, is overwhelming. There's a little girl by the name of Natalie Gilbert. She was 13 years of age. Natalie Gilbert won a little singing contest, and uh, she was asked to sing at, this, at the um, Portland Trail Blazer, Blazers and Dallas Mavericks basketball game in front of 20,000 individuals. 13-year-old girl. Won a little singing contest. The most she's ever sang in front of was probably maybe 100, 200 people. And she comes walking out, in front of 20,000 individuals. She does a good job for a couple phrases. The moment hits her, there are 20,000 individuals watching me. She forgets the words of the song. You could see her countenance fall. She could see in her heart, in her ears, people laughing at her. And people are saying, in front of 20,000, why did they get a 13-year-old little girl that can't even sing? This is embarrassing. You could hear what she was thinking. All of a sudden, her countenance fell. She was embarrassed. This could have been a marked time within her life. She could have never forgiven herself. She would have been embarrassed for the rest of her life. She was in a moment that was going to fix an anchor in her heart, in her life, that she would never forget. But somebody come to her rescue. A guy that couldn't sing a lick. A guy that when he did sing with her, it was terribly off tune. But it was a guy that had the power to change the circumstance she was in. So the coach of the Trailblazers comes walking over to her, starts mouthing the words to her. You could see the joy that she had because somebody came to her rescue. She didn't care who it was. She needed somebody at that moment. And Maurice Cheeks walks up beside her, and he couldn't sing a lick, but he started mouthing the words. And then he started encouraging the crowd, and he started asking the crowd to sing. By the time she finished, the entire audience was singing the song. The coaches were singing the song. She did a wonderful job at the conclusion. Somebody needed help. Watch this clip. And tell me what you would do if that was your daughter struggling and somebody came alongside her and rescued her the most defining moment of her life up to that time. And somebody that didn't plan on singing, somebody that planned on coaching a team came alongside and made this day for this girl, instead of negative, a high point within her life. And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem, please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert.
because you have the ability in you. Sometimes during life, it takes somebody to come alongside you. Sometimes it's a relationship. Sometimes it's a moment, a defining moment, a defining moment in your life and a defining moment in someone else's life. Maurice Cheeks did not plan on singing that song, but he was moved with compassion when somebody is in need. It's not about I. It's about you. It's not about what I need. It's about what you need. And when we deal with relationships, we have to take the eye off of ourselves. We have to be who God created us to be, yes. But everything in life doesn't have to revolve around me. Sometimes the most important thing you could do is when you see somebody and you have the ability to come alongside them, rescue them, help them, and love them, you will be the most important person that have ever come across their life. Not because you have everything together, not because you don't have baggage, not because you can do anything great, it's because you have passion. You have love for somebody. You built a relationship with somebody, and somebody is struggling. Somebody's hurting. Their day, their week, their year, and maybe even their life is in disarray. And you come up beside them. You touch them. You wrap your arms around them. And you say, it's going to be okay. They continue to do their life, but you can come alongside them and help them. You may not change everything about them, but what you've done is you've made an impact within their life at the most defining point in their life, and that's all God has asked you to do. Do not let your past relationships deter you from doing what God wants you to do in the future. Relationships. 85% of everything that we do has to do with people has to do with relationships. And if we do not open our lives up to minister and to care and to love for people, what we're doing is we're allowing the scars of our past to hinder what God wants to do in our future, and that is sad. Put our hearts, our minds, and our love towards God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what he's going to do, he's going to add all these things, the things that we desire the things that we need to our account, the relationships. We are an emotional, relational people. We need that relationship. We desire to be accepted. We desire to be loved. We desire to be successful. What we need is we need people around us to help us. In a church, what the church's goal, what the church's mindset is, is not to be inclusive. Not to say this is all about us. It's to look out and to find the Gilberts and to find Melissa, not the Gilberts, find Natalie Gilbert and to find them that need help and to encourage them, to help them, to make them who they need to be. Not everybody is going to be like us, but what we need to do is minister to everyone as they love us, as we love them. To be a church, to be the family that God wants us to be. We need to be relational. I heard this illustration this week, and I thought it was phenomenal. And we were talking about large churches, and I was at a conference this week, and I was talking to these pastors, and we were asking about things that were going on in their church's life. And, um, you know, in every church, there's dysfunction. And Glenville is not like, it's just like every other church. And I was talking to all these pastors, and we were talking about problems, talking about the church. And, you know, Every church has dysfunction. Every church has problems. And what we have to do is we have to love the church. And, and one of the guys said this. He said, wouldn't it be awesome? Our church runs 500, runs 1,000, runs 2,000. It makes no difference the size of the church. But wouldn't it be awesome if our church had a mindset? We could run 1,000 individuals. But our church had a mindset that our church ran 20. Just 20 people. And everybody that walked in that door was a potential opportunity for us to minister to. Wouldn't it be awesome if the 20 people that were already in the church, when those people walk in for the very first time, they see, hey, 
they may need us. Let us not be happy with our 20. Let us minister. Let us care. Let us get them into our ministry. Let us do ministry together. And as the church grows, all of a sudden new people come in because of the ministry of the church. We need to keep the mindset of a small, little, baby church that needs people, that wants people, that wants to minister to people. What happens to a church when they become of any size, people can walk in the door, we got our bills paid, everything's all right. If they like us, they like us. If they don't, they don't. It's up to them. What happens is people come and people go. Wouldn't it be awesome? And that's in every church. But wouldn't it be awesome if our church, when somebody walks in those doors, it's an opportunity for a Glenville church to build a relationship and to love people that are in need, that we have passion for them, that our church is a mindset of a 20 or 30 member church, that everybody that walks in those doors are important. It's not whether they like it, they like it. No, we need them. We want them. We must minister to them. And every person within our church, whether we run 700 or 1,000 people, we need to treat every person like they're the most important person that has ever walked in those doors because we need them and we want them and we desire them and we need to show them love and gratitude that they are welcome. If we do not do that, we become influential in our own minds but influential significant in their minds and if we ever become insignificant in somebody that needs us to build a relationship with them to give them the faith of jesus christ we have become of no effect to the cause of christ relationship is the most important thing that we can do to build the kingdom of god people do not care how much bible we know what they care about do we love them do we have the message that's going to change their life that is the answer. So let's keep it small. Let's love people. Let's be a church that when somebody walks in those doors, whether they have been invited by a family member or they see a sign or the Holy Spirit has brought them here or they're struggling in some area, let's let them know that they are wanted. They are needed. Not that we have arrived but we need what God has given to us. We need to build that relationship with them because the relationship could change their life. Let's go, Lord, in prayer.